So yeah, so I guess we just get, get kind of started here, and, and I want to keep it really informal. If you guys, any of you have questions, please ask. Uh, so um, I've got uh, well, this. I spoke at HomebrewCon uh, last month. Last month, it was whatever it was, and uh, I just pulled up my uh, presentation from there. I'm not going to go over the whole thing, uh, I, but I just had a couple of slides that were, uh, I guess, of interest. I'll um, grab my thing here so I can control the slides. Oh, sorry. So, um, ah, yeah, just to give you my credentials now because a lot of people say, why am I up here talking instead of somebody else? I've been a home brewer since 1982. So, so for, those, for those of you that remember, uh, home brewing was legalized in 1978. So, so yeah, so 1982, uh, uh, it was when I was a student at the University of Colorado Boulder. And that's where, uh, of course, Charlie started uh, AJ and uh, Brewers Association. I've been a, a professional brewer since 1986. I have a PhD in brewing from the University of Brussels in Belgium. So I was there for four years. I got my doctorate. I'm one of just a handful of people in the world that has a PhD in brewing from Belgium. Um, and then I started Blue Moon Brewing Company for Coors back in 1995. Uh, that grew to become the biggest craft beer brand in the United States and in the world. Um, they make about two million barrels of Blue Moon every year. So it's, it's a big brand. Uh, it's bigger than uh, Coors Bank. Just a little background about Blue Moon. When I started that, um, the folks at Coors really did not like it. They didn't like the flavor. They didn't understand what I was trying to do. Uh, but I told them that I had just returned from Belgium. And I said, that whole thing is coming this way. Uh, craft beer, uh, beer culture, uh, beer dinners. And they said, yeah, sure, yeah. And, so, and, they, and they gave me funding, but they didn't let me brew it in Golden, Colorado. So I had to brew it up in uh, upstate New York, Utica, New York, is where I found it. A contract brewer to, to brew Blue Moon, so that's where I started, but it was up there. Um, and even, even in Golden, I remember when I launched, uh, I had samples of Blue Moon Belgian White. And I remember Pete Coors, he looked at it, he said, why is it cloudy? He said, it's white, it's unfiltered. So he smelled it and tasted it and said, it tastes like lemon pledge. And he said, I don't like it. And then Bill Coors smelled it and looked at it and he said, I'm not going to put that in my mouth. And so he put it there. I, I, honestly, after that, I, I thought Blue Moon was dead. But, uh, but luckily, I did everything I could to keep it alive. Uh, I created that orange garnish to really bring up the orange peel it was brewed with. I did that in 97. I created that, that glass, which I, I didn't create the glass. It's, it's actually a, a Weizenberg glass uh, that a, a glass maker was making out of Germany. So, so we actually ordered that style and turned it into the blue moon glass. Because so, uh, I thought it really highlighted the, the wheat beer nicely. Um, and then last one. Oh no, and then I uh, retired after uh, 32 years. I retired uh, from Blue Moon slash Coors slash Molson Coors. Uh, I retired as the head brew master. Um, and then uh, then after that, I started uh, Seria Brewing Company in 2017, which focuses just on non alcoholic beer and non alcoholic beer made with cannabis. And then, uh, then also, I uh, uh, just authored Brewing with Cannabis because. Uh, about a year ago, the Brewers Association was saying that people, especially craft brewers, were contacting me constantly uh, to, to try to find out how to get the basics about brewing with cannabis. So they asked me then to write the book, um, and I said, sure, but uh, my hesitancy was because the world of cannabis, if, if you guys are familiar with it at all, it's changing almost weekly, almost daily. It's just constantly changing. All kinds of new things are coming up, uh, just all kinds of... Uh, just, and new states are, uh, are uh, legalizing it. When I started writing the book, eight states had it legal uh, from a record perspective. When I finished the book, it was up to 18 states. So it just, it just keeps changing like that. So yeah, uh, and then there's, there's just things that you find out about cannabis all the time. So just a lot of things. So, but uh, we agreed, I agreed with the Brewers Association to write a book, um, at least to set the stage. And then after that, uh, the knowledge base can start moving forward. So, so we did that. So yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. And, uh, um, and then the other thing, if you guys are going to do anything with cannabis, uh, just just make sure that uh, uh, you realize there's a lot of unknowns uh, when you mix alcohol with, with cannabis. Um, the first thing I have here is, is the Vegas. That's, that's something a lot of people um, have probably not heard of, but they know what it is. Vegas nerve is in the back of your throat. When you stick your finger back there and gag, 
you've just activated that nerve. It's, and, and so that's that gag reflex, the vagus nerve. CBD stimu stimulates it so that it doesn't work. So when, you, when you're on CBD or cannabis, you can you can try to gag yourself, and a lot of times you won't be able to, to make yourself self gag because that, that nerve has been stimulated. What that does, though, is if you're on chemo and you've got cancer, you could be having the dry heaves to the to the point where you're throwing up hundreds of times a day. But if you stimulate that nerve with cannabis, that it goes away, so you don't have the dry heaves anymore. But uh, try to think of a situation like if you're at a, a party, maybe you're back in college, uh, and, and people are taking shots of, of tequila. Um, after after somebody takes you know their seventh shot, eighth shot, and they they run for the toilet to throw up because the body starts. It's gonna kill me if it stays there. I, I gotta throw up, so you gotta throw up, and you feel terrible. But um, if you're on cannabis, you won't get that feeling back there, and you can keep going on drinking the whole bottle, and it could still feel okay. And, and that obviously could be very dangerous. You can end up in a hospital, dead, anything. So, so yeah. So CBD and other cannabinoids really are, are unknown right now. So that's why you just just be careful if you're gonna be uh, doing this. And then of course, if, if you drink too much and um, uh, Combine it with cannabis, uh, of course you'll have cross-fading. Cross-fading is that, that term uh, that they used to describe when you're drunk and high at the same time. It's like a cross-fading feeling. And for some people in, in a low dose, it, it's, a, uh, it's real pleasant, but if it gets too high, it can be really, really, um, I guess it can make you feel really, really afraid and, um, to the point of almost becoming psychotic. So that's why just be really careful. And then of course, if you drink too much uh, and alcohol and a bunch of cannabis, you can get couch locked, or you're uh, on the couch for you know, three hours. And it's, it sounds funny, but you don't want to be that that guy or that lady who's on the couch, you know, zonked out because they're, they're they're couch locked because of cannabis. So, so just be careful. And then again, um, the last thing uh, is the four loco story. I think I've always heard about that. In the '90s, brewers, uh, especially, were, were infatuated with. Uh, putting caffeine into alcoholic drinks, and uh, everybody, pretty much everybody did it. Uh, Four Loco was the one that really overdid it. They, they had these big cans, 24 ounce cans, and, and in there they advertised that there was uh, as much alcohol as four cans of regular beer, and uh, as much caffeine as two big cups of coffee. And of course, mixing alcohol with cannabis led to people getting in trouble. You had uh, uh, people with heart issues coming up, you had people. Uh, campus rapes went up, and just all kinds of crazy things happened. So the FDA had to really step in and uh, write a letter saying, you know, take these things off the shelves because they're dangerous. So uh, brewers were forced to take them off. So again, unknowns with cannabis were right at the forefront. And here in Colorado, all of us are lucky that we can do this. Uh, there's still a lot of states where you can't just go to a dispensary and buy buds and experiment and brew. So we're, all of us as, as brewers, home brewers, we're way on the cutting edge of what can be done. So, so be careful because uh, you can set the stage in the future for either something really cool or something to avoid. Um, and the other thing is the last time someone wrote a book about cannabis was 1996. Ed Rosenthal, he did it. But I have a copy of the book. If you're if you're fortunate enough to find a copy, you'll see that there's not a lot there. It's it's pretty pretty basic. Uh, he does have recipes for uh, brewing, which are uh, all extract based. So he's got uh, extract based recipes. And in fact, he let me uh, use a few in the book. So from a historical perspective, I use those recipes so you can see uh, what brewing was like when, when this book came out. And uh, he actually, he actually uh, co-authored it with someone called The Unknown Brewer. And I was always wondering who that was. So I talked to him and he said that that's actually him. He did it because in '96 it was illegal to, to do to do this stuff, and if they would have tracked him down um, and gone after Ed, he could have just blamed the unknown brewer. He said, "Well, you know, I'm not going to give up his name because this is a book. It's not a it's not a, an ounce of marijuana that you can this. So, so yeah, so he did that, um, and actually half the book is, is kind of beerish stuff. The other half is uh, consists of labels you have to label your your bottles. So, so it's, a, it's a, an interesting book. Uh, so then here we are in 2021. Uh, the book I wrote uh, kind of takes it from there, but really takes it forward because I talk about uh, everything. The 
history of the plant, how to uh, uh, how to grow it yourself in your in your home, uh, how to uh, uh, harvest the buds, how to uh, activate them, make them water soluble, put them in beverages, and I even have recipes in there. Things like uh, I've got a uh, uh, peanut butter porter, I've got a uh, chocolate uh, uh, coconut cream stout, I've got uh, a 1970s lager uh, there, and, and that one. One, th one thing I didn't say was when, when I was at Coors Blue Moon uh, in 2021, they asked me to be formally a banquet or something. Because if, if, if you remember, they launched Coors Light in 1978, and, and Coors Light just started growing with that and cannibalized the original Coors beer. And Coors, the sales just started going down and down and down. And so what happened is um, they tried changing the name from uh, Coors to Coors Draft to Coors Original to Original Coors. And by that time, it just, it, nothing worked, it was way down. So they asked me to reformulate it. So I put together a team, we worked with the marketing people, and uh, let's see, we, we lightened up the body, dropped the IBUs, uh, changed the hopping, uh, just smoothed the whole thing out. Dropped the alcohol from 5.5 five to 5. Uh, and, uh, gosh, we got IBUs, we dropped from like 16 down to like 12. Uh, things that have really smoothed out the flavor. And, and then what happened is we, uh, we went on a complete reversal and started growing for like 17 years. So, uh, so see how that uh, ankle beer is, is, has really, it really took off. And I forgot where, where I was going with that, but it's a, uh, uh, anyway, so the book, the book, I, I, I tried to talk about a lot of things. Oh yeah, I know, the recipe in there for, uh, in the book for 1970s log is based loosely on, on the recipe for Coors Banquet beer that was produced during the 70s. Uh, which, uh, if you remember Smokey and the Bandit, that, that was 19, that was the highlight of, of uh, Coors Banquet beer. Back then it was called Coors, but uh, again, the recipe is based on that. And then the other thing I did is, I thought, with that recipe, why not make it so you can take it in the sun and drink it and it won't turn skunky? And so last year at the World Brewing Congress, my, my daughter and I published a, uh, uh, we figured out how beer turns skunky and how to, you could actually reverse that sensory aspect. You could prevent it and you could reverse it. So uh, just by using a teeny tiny bit of copper, copper sulfate, copper gluconate, you put that in, not to the point where you do taste metallic, just enough. Because when you, when you uh, think about it, uh, the skunky compound in beer uh, is very, very strong. We can all pick it up with the parts per trillion. So it's super strong. So you just need a teeny tiny bit of copper to prevent that. And what happens is you can, you can use in the recipe in the book, you can make a, a nice lager, you can walk out in this bright sunshine with your, your nice 1970s smoky and cool beer. <laughs> and, uh, and I talk about how to, how to put the cannabis in it too. So you can walk around on the beach by the pool in the sun and it won't turn skunky and you can just enjoy it and, uh, and make a home batch for your friends too and really uh, have a, a pseudo beach parties and without having a beer turn skunky. So, so anyway, that, I, I have a lot of information in the book uh, that helps with that. Um, and then uh, the other thing is just make sure you follow all the legalities because because it's uh, uh, it's legal in 18 states right now. Can be something from a record, record perspective, but you have to make sure it's it's, it's legal in the state because I think all of us here are probably from Colorado and live here. But uh, there's a lot of people that will tr get the book from Amazon or something, and then they uh, they will try to do this and find out it's illegal and could end up in jail. Um, even growing at home. Make sure you're, you're doing it the right way because there are some some penalties in, in different states here's oregon oregon we think of as being pretty progressive when it comes to cannabis but if you're caught growing within a thousand feet of a school playground uh, it's considered a felony you could face up to 20 years in prison and a uh, three hundred and seventy-five thousand dollar fine. that's that's oregon so that's that's pretty severe so that's why I just realize uh, or know what the laws are uh, colorado one thing that a lot of people don't realize is you can't grow outside. It's, it's illegal in Colorado. Uh, you have to do it inside. Uh, and then you have to keep your plants indoors and locked away from miners. That's, that's in the, the laws for cannabis. So be aware of the laws so that you don't get uh, caught and made an example. <laughs> and then uh, I just wanted to talk about how hops and cannabis are related. And that's, that's part of the reason I wrote the book was because you know, a lot of us uh, say that hops and, and, and cannabis are cousins, and, and they really are because they both come from the Cannabaceae family. There are, I think, 11 or 12 uh, genera in that family of Cannabaceae. 
but the two most important ones are hops, which are humulus, and then uh, cannabis, which is just cannabis, cannabis, cannabis sativa. And so those two are really, really uh, important to all of us, uh, and they're considered cousins because they're in the same family, but they're also considered cousins because if you take a, a cannabis branch, cut it off, and then graft it onto a hop plant, it'll continue growing and making buds. And, and vice versa, if you take a hop a plant or branch and graft it onto a cannabis plant, it'll continue making hop cones. The one that, that's uh, science was carried out in the 1970s, and they proved you can do that. The thing they also proved is that the hop cones will not have crossover cannabis in them, and the buds will not have crossover hop compounds in them. So the branch grows, but it stays separate. So, uh, but yeah, the, and they're close enough, and that's why people really were saying, "Oh, these are cousins." And then. I think the other thing is that the female plants are the ones that are important to the industries. So all of us know that hops, when you're uh, using hops, those come from the female plant. The male hops, you don't want them anywhere near the females, because if they fertilize the females, your hop quality just goes down the tubes. Um, same with cannabis. You go to, into any of these grow houses, they're all female plants. If there's any males that get close to those, they will be uh, discarded right away, because once a female becomes fertilized, the, the buds become very poor quality because then the female will start making seeds and you don't want those because then the, the THC, all the cannabinoids, the quality just goes down, downhill quickly. Um, and the structures too. Hop cones, uh, all of us know what hop cones look like. You usually buy them in the form of compressed, compressed hop pellets. But a cone looks like a green pine cone. And then uh, cannabis trichomes uh, are little structures on the plant that contain all the cannabinoids and the terpenes and you show a picture yeah here so obviously these are hops on this side nice green hop cones but on that side you see uh, the tip of the cannabis plant and you see all those little light structures those are called trichomes uh, they look almost like glass structures uh, but they're uh, little tiny uh, structures that contain all the cannabinoids and the uh, terpenes and that's the stuff you want from the plant just like with the hop leaves, what you want is that nice lupulin powder from, from in between there, the lupulin glands. That's the stuff you want. And, and from the cannabis plant, you want those trichomes. And years ago, what they did is uh, uh, Afghan, in Afghan, Afghanistan, and that area there, they figured out if you scraped all those uh, trichomes off the plant, you can make it into a paste, and then uh, you can break it off and smoke that stuff, and that's called hash. And so, uh, and that's how they, they start making hash years ago, easily a thousand years ago. But that stuff is really potent, and that's why I, and it's only on the female plant. And then there's a lot of things, a lot of the cannabinoids. I go over these in the book, but uh, THC is the one that almost everybody is familiar with. It, it brings about intoxication, euphoria, and then CBD is the other one a lot of people are familiar with. Pain relief, relaxation, uh, but there's others too, CBN, CBG, THCV. Uh, there's over a hundred cannabinoids in the plant. And most people aren't familiar with them. In fact, even experts uh, don't know all of all of these things. And that's where, once we see federal legalization come in, uh, we're going to see private industry, pharmaceuticals, and especially universities, public universities, get in and start to find out what these things do. Because when they start patenting them, uh, people are going to start making a fortune. Because there are some cannabinoids that are rumored to be just like Viagra, some that are just like caffeine. Some that give you strength, so almost like a super strength. Just all kinds of crazy things that these cannabinoids do on the body, to the body, and uh, and that's why that's why there's so much interest because once it goes federally legal, uh, it's like people are going to jump in like crazy to patent as much as they can. And one thing, as you get into this, uh, you have to realize that uh, the cannabinoid, cannabinoids in the plant they don't exist in this, exist in an active form. You have to activate. Them. Just like hops, uh, you have to activate hops to make them bitter. Um, and it's, again, it's very similar to hops here. You have to isomerize the alpha acids to make them bitter. The THC, you have to decarboxylate that into THCA, THC, and CBD. Again, it exists in car uh, carboxylated form. You have to decarboxylate using uh, heat. Um, here's, here's a quick slide showing uh, on the top uh, one of the main alpha acids in hops is humulin. You boil it in the kettle and it isomerizes into isohumulin. And, uh, and that's, uh, all of us have done that. We know that it, once it's isomerized, it has that really nice bitterness that you, that you look for in beer. 
Um, and then below that is the THCA reaction where you use heat, and that circle, green circle, shows the, the carboxylic acid component that gets chopped off with heat, and then you have fully active uh, cannabinoid there, THC. Same thing with CBD, CBG, and all the cannabinoids. They have to be activated with heat, and the temperature's a little bit above 200 degrees, which is the same as uh, hops. So, so again, very similar, which is real strange. I thought. Then terpenes are also really interesting because terpenes exist in hops. The main terpene in hop is, is myrcene, uh, which we smell, especially on fresh hops, in fresh hops. It's a grassy smell. Well, it also exists in cannabis. This, this uh, table here shows uh, some of the, the terpenes in this home here and shows the hop prevalent one there, which is humulant. That's mainly in hops that that's present. And then uh, limonene is one that's present uh, mainly in cannabis. And then the bottom three, myrcene, caryophylline, and pharnacine, are present in both hops and cannabis. But you can make a table like this with all the terpenes, and there's a lot of them, much more in, in cannabis than hops. But they, do, they actually do things to the body. So cumulin, for example, is uh, appetite suppressant. Uh, limonene uh, gives some sedative powers. So that's why uh, we've all heard of aromatherapy. Uh, aromatherapy uses different aromas to, to do these things, and it's the terpenes because they really work. Uh, they don't make you high, but they do have all these things. And when you combine them with uh, cannabinoids, you have what's called the entourage effect. We have cannabinoids with terpenes, put them together, and they entourage just means that the whole works better than the part. So, so all those cannabinoids and terpenes working together really uh, increase the, the activity of everything. So, if you have, uh, at the bottom row there, if you have THCV, which is a cannabinoid, they call it the skinny cannabinoid, you put in humulene, you could have a really great uh, appetite suppressant for people who uh, want to lose weight. Um, and, and you can do, mix these things up and do all kinds of crazy things. Uh, so that's, that's one example there. Uh, you can also uh, use the terpenes and the cannabinoids, and it would give you the munchies and create things. And, and that, like people say, well, why would, I, why would I want the munchies? Well, that would be valuable for people, again, older people uh, in, in um, nursing homes, people uh, who have cancer who have lost their appetite. Uh, you know, they take that stuff, and all of a sudden their appetite's back, they've got the munchies, and they're on the phone with Papa John's for a large pizza. And, uh, so yeah, so there's all kinds of things you can do. And again, from my perspective, it's fun to find out all this stuff and to make it available, but I know there's people out there who their first thing is, man, how can I make money with this? And, and, and there's stuff like that. But, you know, when you know this stuff, you can put, put it together and it really works. And there's going to be people making a fortune when uh, you see legalization. And the last thing is really making NA beer at home. A lot of us, I don't know if any of you people have tried, but uh, there are really only these, these ways you can do it to at home. Um, there are other ways that professional brewers sort of use to remove alcohol and do things, but but from a, from a home brewer's perspective, arrested fermentation is probably uh, one of the easiest because you just start with a low gravity uh, and then you, you let the yeast ferment, but you set up the parameters so it just gets up to about half a, half a percent alcohol and there shouldn't be any more fermentables in there, and then, then you're pretty much done. Uh, you could use novel yeasts, which don't ferment uh, maltose or maltose triose, and just limit the amount of glucose that's formed. Uh, but those aren't brewer's yeasts. Those are typical yeasts that have been uh, isolated from like rotting fruit and stuff. They don't ferment glucose. Um, and the, the last one is, is the, I, I think, one of the better ways to do it. This distillation at 170 degrees Fahrenheit, which is the boiling point of alcohol. So you're just, after you uh, brew, ferment, and age, and then you take that, pour it in the kettle, heat it up to 173 degrees, and just hold it there uh, for about an hour. And when the alcohol starts coming off, you should be able to smell it. It's a sweet, solventy smell coming off. And when it comes off, the first hour is pretty strong. And then after that, the smell goes way down. And, and so what I do is I recommend just uh, using your senses when you, when you bring it up to 173, just keep smelling. And you'll smell that strong, solventy smell. It'll go away after 45 minutes-ish. And at that point, just hold it for another 30 minutes at 173, and you should be down to uh, Chart here. You should be down to like half half a percent. So I took a, a five percent ABV beer and held it at 173. And you can see after uh, 30 minutes it was already down to roughly one and a half percent ABV. And then by uh, 
and that's where I, I said we do 30 minutes more. And at that point, I was down to half half a percent, which is um, NA beer. So, so yeah, and you can keep going if you want. You can hold it for two, three hours if you want. But there's there's really no no need to do that unless you really want zero alcohol beer. Um, the other thing you have to also be aware of is with that extra heating step, you're going to have more summarization of the hops because during the kettle, not everything's going to be a summary. So you will pick up anywhere from five to ten extra IBUs if you make NA beer. So just be aware of that. Yeah, so I really just want to keep it short. Uh, kind of talk about the uh, those aspects that are important to homebrewers and, and even cannabis uh, users. In the book, I, I talk more about uh, how to how to really work with the, the plant, how to uh, activate it. As, as I said, it's got to be activated, and then how to extract. The easiest way to extract is using putting your butts first. Take your buds, put them in the oven, uh, heat them up to activate them, and then you put them in alcohol uh, for a couple of days to extract all the cannabinoids. And then you've got a, a high, uh, high potency uh, solution. And then in the book, I have a uh, Excel spreadsheet type of situation where you can enter the, the, the percent THC you start with, the volume of your homebrew, about like five gallons, uh, and what what final uh, THC per 12 ounce bottle uh, desired is. And then you type all that in and say, oh, uh, you need uh, 10 milliliters of this tincture in your five gallons to get 10 milligrams per, per stroke. So in so there I talk about how to do that because I know homebrewers always like like to have kind of an easy way to figure out all these things. You know? So it's given at the end. It's not like uh, in the old days you'd make brownies or something and you know, you'd have a brownie and it was always a gamble. You didn't know if it was 100 milligrams or if it was 5 milligrams. And so, and so you want to know uh, what to expect. Because with cannabis, uh, it, it can hit you pretty hard. It's, luckily, for most people, it's, it's not, uh, you won't end up in the hospital uh, like, like with alcohol. You can seriously die <laughs> from having too much alcohol from blood poisoning. But with cannabis, uh, there haven't really been any issues where people die from having too much THC. So, you get pretty wasted and you'll feel terrible. You feel like you're having a heart attack and everything, but you'll be just fine. So. <laughs> you'll be that guy on the ground. Yeah. You'll, be, you'll, be, you'll get a full couch lock. It's couch lock, yeah. It's and, it's not, yeah. and it's not, yeah, yeah it's, it's definitely, you know, it's just like alcohol. People getting into alcohol, you don't want to get shots of tequila right away. You know, you want to get the in a way that they, they can have a beer or something and just get used to it and enjoy it. You don't want to hurt the people, your friends. So yeah, so with, with cannabis, uh, again, cannabis is one of those things that it's, it's relatively new and I think uh, uh, combining it with homebrew is really a great way to start. Because you're not smoking it, your lungs are nice and healthy, you're uh, consuming it, and it's fully active. Now, the only thing I would say is that um, with uh, beer, it will go into your system nicely, and you'll be fine. You'll get buzz, it'll go away after probably an hour or so. So it's just uh, a nice uh, feeling. If you put the cannabis into an edible, like a brownie or something, then it's different because it goes through your whole digestive tract. And when it does that, at the very end, the liver uh, changes it from delta 9 THC to delta 11, which is more potent. That's the one. that's why we, if you have edibles, you could have a, a much stronger Buzz. Uh, you wake up in the morning, you know, still feeling kind of groggy because it's delta 11. So uh, when it goes through the digestive tract, you just have to watch out. It does become more potent. But in this case, uh, brewing with it, it start, it absorbs to the soft tissues of the mouth, and uh, yeah, pretty much by the time it hits the stomach, it, it's going in. So it's, it goes faster. Uh, typically, uh, I would say 15 minutes to uh, 30 minutes, you'll really start feeling. Sensation of cannabis versus two hours for edibles. So, uh, so yeah, so it's just it's fun, and, and my hope is that you guys who experiment with it can really, uh, you know, ho hopefully uh, write into like Zymergy or something, some some, some uh, updates so that uh, as a knowledge base, brewers hopefully can start uh, learning more and more about this. Because uh, to me, home brewers are the ones who are really on that cutting edge. Craft brewers usually. Cool things, but it's the homebrewers. They're 
the brewing license is in peril if they do so. Their the jeopard, their the whole livelihood is not jeopardized. So they, they can really get out and do so. And uh, that's really uh, hoping is what really brought us to where we are today. So that's why I hope you guys do experiment to have some fun and um, uh, play around with it and come up with some cool new ways to use cannabis. Who knows, you may come up with a, a better way to activate it or a better way to make it water soluble or something. Or you may start your own company. <clears throat> we'll be about you being the next Bill Gates of the, <laughs> of the cannabis world. I don't know. But, uh, and that's, that's another thing uh, I hear a lot about from people is uh, they're pretty, a lot of people just straight up up front and forward. They say, how can I make money with this? <laughs> and, and, and it's like, just get in and whatever you think is fun, just zero in on that. And you play around with it. Because with cannabis, there's so many aspects of it. Growing is part of it. The, the, Trimming part, of it, you know, uh, making it water soluble, you know, finish goods, all that stuff. It's just crazy because um, just so many things to do. Uh, here, you guys may do it on the side, but one of you may, may find a cool niche that when it becomes federally legal, uh, some, uh, some part of your pharmaceutical company may say, "Hey, I'll come buy that for you for twenty-five million dollars." Of course, you. Our perspective, that's a lot of money. From their perspective, that's probably change. Right back here. Perfect. They'll, uh, so, yeah, so, well, yeah, so hopefully somebody, somebody in this room will uh, raise a lot of great customers, and hopefully you guys will uh, come up with some way to, to have a little business that gets scooped up by a pharmaceutical company, and all of a sudden you just sell it for $30 million. And, uh, gosh, yeah. You could, uh, at least send, send right a postcard from your from your private uh, suite of uh, whatever. <laughs> but yeah, so so with that, um, if you have any questions, please go to the Oh, Raffle, you can. Yeah, please. Okay. In, in the book, do you talk about how using cannabis affects the flavor profiles of different dressings? Yeah. <laughs> we did a turkey one, we put it in a bear, and it very tasty. So I'm hoping that there's pairing ideas or steering me towards certain hop varieties and certain cannabis varieties. You can, yeah, so, so with, with the same with hops, there are different varieties of hops and different strains of cannabis. Um, one thing you have to watch out for with cannabis is that nursing is really at the top. And so it's, it's almost like uh, using fresh hops all the time. It's that grassy character that all of us there, even with all the different uh, strains. Uh, the other thing to watch out for is Dank character of cannabis is almost always in two. And that dankness is, is usually caused by MBT, the same pop up as a smoky or a light structure. So, so that's those two make it a little more difficult. But if you can find the isolated THC and CBD, then just use those because those have only bitterness. They don't have any aroma. So, so the cannabinoids are really good. Just make water solid more use them. So you just mentioned the same things that skunk compounds. Earlier you mentioned copper sulfate. Copper sulfate also reduced that dankiness. That's one thing I've been wanting to try to see if it works in cannabis. Because it could, and that's one thing my, my daughter and I, when we figured that out, we didn't patent it, we just uh, put it out there for, for brewers to use. Not just a supermarket. For us, we didn't want to make a fortune. We could have easily patented that stuff and sold it to Heineken, Corona. Cannabis, it, it, it may work. Well, I mean, work. Because that's one thing that a lot of people don't like is that smell of cannabis. It's really polarizing. Right? Right. You either like it or you don't like it. Most people don't like it. There's a few who love it. They absolutely can't get enough of that cannabis smell. But most people don't like it. And yeah, so that's, what, that's on my list of things to do that. There's no retired guy. I thought I would have more time. But I've never been running around with you. Oh, did everybody get a ticket? Did everybody get a ticket? Yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> 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 Do you have a number? 
Yes, maybe this woman he is. Three hundred. Okay. Here, sorry. <laughs> 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 that happens to be a story in your book about how different levels of stage so you get into solution and beer. Exactly, there is, yes. There's like a, a, in there a kind of an Excel uh, spreadsheet type of uh, situation where you can enter the, the known THC content in regards to yeah. uh, the volume of your home room and what your desired milligrams of THC in the final form. So I've, I've done a couple of different little batches, some using various, probably very similar to math to what's in the book. I haven't seen it yet, but um, I decided that I use, like, during the serving process, I'll add ripple. And that seems to be my best bet for consistency. Mm -hmm. Have you ever found any, well, either from bottling, but any inconsistencies from, like, in the same batch during? Well, yeah, one thing about ripple, ripple's nice because it dissolves quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the only issue I, I have is the flavor, because to me, I always get a, it's a chemical flavor with ripple. And I don't like that in my, my beer uh, or water. So, so with, with the, if you make your own extracts, uh, obviously, if it's in alcohol, you won't have that uh, chemical taste. You just have the chemical taste. And yeah, you, you can dial in how much you want in the final 12 ounce bottle. And um, yeah, you just have the taste of the beer plus the taste of the cannabis. Mm -hmm. Find the isolates, the CO, uh, the uh, THC and CBD isolates. That's even better because then you can focus on the taste of the beer and not the taste of cannabis. Mm -hmm. That's that's what we do with our uh, infused products. We use just isolated uh, THC and CBD, and that way you get the effects of cannabis with the taste of craft beer. Mm -hmm. so that's, that's what I, I always wanted to do is, is really uh, give beer drinkers a choice of having they have regular alcoholic beer or craft beer that has the effects of cannabis. We've had good luck with all that. Anybody want me to sign here? I got a question for you, Keith. Yeah. When you're formulating recipes for the beers, do you intend on having a Indica IPA and a Sativa IPA, or, you, you know? You can. I do, I, with, with the isolates, isolates are isolates? It's just isolates, so yeah, there is no carryover of that particular. Right, no, none of those traits carry over with the isolates. So. And with isolates, if you, if you drew, uh, I, I would urge you to, to go to places and, and ask if they sell shake or trim. <laughs> That's that stuff is the best because it's cheap. It, buds, if you, if you if you buy buds, okay. How many how many of you have bought an eighth of buds in the last month? Okay, what did you pay for the eighth? Like probably fifty, fifty bucks for a certain. Yeah, like how much time did you say? For a full ounce, a full ounce. <laughs> you're talking, you're talking a couple hundred dollars for a full ounce. And so, uh, so that's a lot of, lot of uh, money to spend for an ounce. Say two hundred dollars an ounce. You trim and shake. You can buy that stuff for a pound of it for about 150 bucks. So that's a, that's a lot of material. You can extract it yourself and, and work with it. So yeah, it's, uh, I, I would say if you're going to do any brewing, home brewing, try to find a trim. Yeah, totally. These have all been paid for by us, so yeah, you pay for it. For it.
We have more beer for anyone who wants to sample it. So I noticed the, uh, this is like a regular open. When I bought it, uh, there was not Cali's, it's just on the street here. It has this different, like, kind of opening mechanism. Do you see it here, folks? I think it doesn't, it's not a can-can, it's like a, a slide. And we can ask him, I, I'm not bought that one. Because so. I just expect it to be the same right now, but I thought there was some regulation. With Maybe it was more than one service. Like seven wasn't Can I ask another question? You know, like in Colorado, we yeah. have more than um, one serving in a container. Exactly. Oh, yeah, so we um, talked a lot about, you know, you're brewing the NAB or it's just in it, which is, I didn't even think about that before. Um, and, but is there a situation where uh, it makes sense to, like, do an alcohol beer and then add the cannabis, or is that kind of like a no no, or is it kind of like a discretion? At your discretion. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, uh, mixing alcohol yeah. and cannabis. Uh, well, how strong, how strong do you want it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, are you talking like a 90% yeah. getting out of an IPA? Or you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like, um, <laughs> it's like, it's like, it's Yeah. Um, I do have a question. Whatever, I'm probably not going to. I just like, add a couple of, like, <laughs> fish percent. Like, yeah, like, did you start as, like, a, you know, fermentation? Oh, like, well, like, Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I just turned the boiling it off is what I would do probably for the NA. The sun is for CSU. It's like and one more step. I'm just uh, lazy. <laughs> wanting to go into fermentation. They have a degree in that. <laughs> that would be the smoke. Yeah, yeah, same. But it's like if you I think it's a big segment. You know what you're doing, sure. right? I mean, yeah, you know, two of my three friends. I know. I know. But it is very good. Um, yeah. But you can have them. Yeah. 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 I was going to say, are there rules for getting this home? No, man. I guess, yeah. I'm assuming they can't buy it. 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 It's still drinking, still out. It's still out. It's still out. I can do it at home. You can consume it myself. I can't, probably can't take it out of the home. You definitely can't take it. Well, I think that's right. I don't know if the younger generation is like so concerned. Yeah.